Honesty, how are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast, episode 5 of our 5 part series of the Thorn this month. Very exciting, it's really exciting. I'm Aaron Hegarty and I'm sitting down in the shop as where we record all this magic stuff with my sister. And I'm Sarika Hegarty and I'm also sitting down in the shop as with my brother. Uh, this is, as Aaron said, Patreon Appreciation Month. We are... Didn't say that, but... Oh, well... Just you should have. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Please continue interrupting me. <laughs> You're on it. You're on it. Part five, Patreon Appreciation Month. We love it. Carry on. Yeah. Let's just go on to the story. Okay. Now the first man of Ulster to wake from the curse of Maka after nine days of sleeping in rest, after the nine days of pain was a man named Cethern from Sleeve Food. He woke with an iron spit in his hand and when he saw his lands ravaged, he ran straight at the men of Ireland. He ran into them and killed a handful of them but was wounded so badly he hobbled and barely got back to where he found Cucullin lying in his weakness and sickness, covered in healing herbs himself. Cucullin called for the healers of Ireland to be sent to him. These physicians could come and do nothing for the man. And so Cucullin sent for Fingen, Grohor Magnas's greatest healer. Fingen was the greatest physician of all Ireland. It was said of him that he could tell what a person's sickness was by looking at the smoke of the house that he was in. And he'd know by looking at any wound what sort of person gave it. So then this man came and Catherine showed him his wounds. Look at this wound for me, Fingen, said Catherine. Fingen examined the wound. He said, Oh, I that wound was made by two brothers. It was true indeed. Two young men came at me, and they were like no other. One had curly brown hair, and the other yellow curling locks. Two green cloaks about them, with brooches of silver. Two soft shirts of yellow silk, and bright swords in their hands they had. Cucullin knew who he was talking about. I know those two very well. They're Manya Ahrma and Manya Mahrma, two sons of Oliel and Maeve. Manya like his father, and Manya like his mother. Now look at that sair wound as well. What do you make of this one? Fingen looked at the other wound. Ah, aye. This was made by a father and a son, made together. Aye, that's true. Uh, there came two large men with flaming eyes, and they had gold bands around their head, and they dressed like kings, and gold swords in their sides. I know those two very well. That was Oliel and his son, Manya Andog, that gave you that wound. Huh. Well, what do you make of this wound here, so Fingen? Fingen once more looked at the third wound on the man near death. Oh, that wound, that was made by a proud woman. That's true as well. There came at me a beautiful, pale, long-faced woman with long, flowing hair on her, a crimson cloak with a brooch of gold on her breast, and a straight spear shining in her red right hand. And it was she gave me that wound, and she got a little wound from me as well. I know that woman well. She's Maeve, daughter of the High King of Ireland, Queen of Connacht. She would have thought it a great victory and a great triumph, you to have fallen by her hand. Now Fingen gave him a choice, to be in bed for a year and a day, or spend one day with his full strength on him. Either way he would die, he said. Catherine said, give me back my strength for one day, fuck it, or something like that. Now the druid made a bath for him. They went and they stole some of the cattle that the men of Ireland had driven out of Ulster. They gathered the cattle, chopped them in pieces, and threw them with the skin and flesh and bone into a great bath. And they left Catherine in this huge hole and broth for three days. Now, 
When Catherine stood up from this magical druid's bath, he felt rejuvenated once more, and his wife, Edna, brought him his sword so he wouldn't pick up the iron spit again in foolish haste. Now he ran towards the men, and the men of Ireland saw him coming, and they were fearful of him, but to trick him, they put all Eel's cloak around a standing stone and a crown upon it, and they stood back as they saw Catherine running towards it, and Catherine attacked it, breaking his sword against it, and when they cut him down, he threw his shield, which had a sharp ring around it, through Manya Ando, cutting him in half, but he was the only lad he managed to kill that day. The next of the Ulster men to awaken from the curse was Rukhad, son of Fathaman. He came with three times fifty men. Now Finnever had long been in love with Rukhad, and she went to her mother Maeve when she saw him coming, told her mother all her troubles, and Maeve said to her daughter, well, go to him then, if you love him. Spend the night with him, and tell him to go back with his men and wait until the whole host of Ulster is gathered. And if you can do that, I give you my leave for you to be his wife. And so Finnever went to find Rukkath to persuade him to draw his men back until the final day of battle should come. But it was heard of in the camp. And there were twelve kings of Munster, and to each of them privately Maeve had promised the hand of her daughter Finnever of the fair eyebrows. When they heard that Finnever had gone to Rochid and pledged her love to him, each of them spoke up at the insult, and then, comparing notes, each of them realised that they'd been promised the same woman in marriage. And they rose up against Maeve on account of the treachery she'd done to them. Fergus McRoy managed to quell the uprising and managed to get the peace restored in the army, but not before 700 men lost their lives. And then Finnever, returning to the army after her tryst with Rukhid, found out that 700 men had died on her account that her mother had secretly promised her hand in marriage to so many of her allies. And her heart broke with the shame and the grief, and Finnever of the Fair Eyebrows died. Now the next one of the Ulstermen to wake up was a man named Iliuk. He had thought his fighting days were over. He was old and spent. But he tied his horses, that were also very old, to his chariot. He put no skins or cushions on his chariot. He heaved his heavy iron sword and shield onto his arms and made a pile of stones in the chariot too. Then, naked as the day he was born, he ran towards the army. When the army saw him coming at them this way, the men of Ireland laughed at him. They mocked and jeered the man who seemed far too old and frail to fight. But Ilya was glad of their welcome, and the men that laughed and jeered were suddenly met with stones in their heads, and he killed a fair amount before he himself was cut down. When he was cut down, he gave his sword to Ducky, son of Mogok, and told him to give his sword to his grandson. Larry Buyuk, the battle winner of Ulster. Now Cúchulainn, lying still in the sickness of his wounds, told Sulitim, his mother's husband, to go and wake the men of Ulster. They'd slept long enough after the curse, and it was time now to drive out the men of Ireland. And so Sulitim mounted up on the grey of Macha and rode towards Awan Macha calling out to awaken the men of Ulster. But his voice was thin and did not carry on the winter air. The men of Ulster did not stir and did not awaken. And riding to the battlements of Awanmaka, the grey horse tripped. Sulitim fell heavily against his shield, and his head was struck off on its sharp rim. 
but falling, his head tangled, his body tangled, and the Grey of Macha galloped on, dragging now the headless corpse of Sudutum, and his head in the hollow of his shield. And his last words, calling out to the men of Ulster to arise and drive out their enemies, still came through the mouth of his severed head. And that cry was so terrible that all who heard it awoke and arose from their beds. Now Grohor Magnassa woke, as did the rest of the Red Branch. The Crave Rua now took up their arms, and they all marched the Irard Cullen. When Grohor got there with his thirty hundred fierce chariot drivers, he asked why everyone had stopped. He was told they were waiting for the Grave Rua to amass there, but Grohor was not satisfied with this, because he knew Oliel and Maeve were driving off people as they spoke. So Grohor gathered his thirty hundred fierce chariot fighters and drove after Oliel and Maeve. And it was not long till they came on eight times twenty strong men, bringing each of them a woman of Ulster with them. Grohor struck off their heads and set the woman free. And then Grohor marched towards the army. Maeve saw him coming and she told her army to make a pen to try and trap these men in for she wanted to take them alive. The exiles of Ulster, who were on Maeve's side, were so insulted by this, attempting to capture Crohor Magnassa and any of the Crave Rua alive, that they nearly stood up themselves and took out their swords to attack her. But the Galena of Leinster made peace. Maeve arranged her army all the same on three sides with a smaller group of 30,000 ready to come in after Grohor Magnessa and trap him and surround him, sure that in spite of the reaction of the Ulstermen, that she would be able to take Grohor Magnessa, her great enemy, alive and humiliate him utterly. Now, that was the most foolish idea that was held by anybody in all of the cattle raid of Cooley, because Grohor and his fierce chariot drivers they drove straight through the mass ranks of Maeve's army and out to the other side, and wheeling back again, punched through the other side. There was no trap that she could make of her army that would hold such men as they were. And with that done, Crohor turned his men back to the north and back to Eard Cullen to await the massing of the army. Now in Maeve's camp, all of the men of Ireland were getting ready for the final battle. And two men of Ulster, that were the exiles, awoke with warning dreams of darkness and doom. Cormac, Cullingus, Grohor's own son, would face against the Grave Rua, with Dovtok, the beetle of Ulster, by his side. But the two men had a bad feeling about the fight that was to come. Maeve sent out McGrath then to see whether or not the army was upon them yet or not. McGrath came back with reports that he saw a cloud moving towards them with snow swirling within it and sparks like fire spreading around. Fergus McRoy spoke then. He said that was the dust kicked up by the horses. No cloud. It was not snow he saw, but foam from the horse's mouths being whipped into action and those sparks of fire. But they were the red, hot, angry eyes of the Crave Rua marching towards them. The army marched towards them. Before the fight, they made camp in Clartha. The following morning, Maeve sent McGrath to find out what he'd see again. McGrath reported back. He saw a great company of men come and dig out a great seat on a hillside. 
and the man that came to sit in that seat and survey the valley below where the battle would take place. He had the appearance of a tall, proud man, used to giving orders. He had yellow curling hair and a yellow forked beard, a red, pleasant face, and blue eyes you would be afraid of. That was Crahor, son of Fiogna and son of Ness, the High King of Ulster said Fergus McRoy. There was a man stood beside him, said McGrath, with scattered white hair and a purple cloak, and a shield with bosses of red brass, and a long iron sword of foreign make. And he looked up to the sky and threw his hand upwards, and with that, the clouds seemed like as if they were rushing all at one another, and fire came from them towards the men of Ireland. That was Kaffa the Druid, said Fergus, and he was trying by his enchantments to know how the battle would go tomorrow. Macross described the many troops he saw, and then the troop that came at the last. They came without a leader, he said. There were thirty hundred in it, proud, clean, ruddy men, with long, fair hair and shining eyes, long, shining cloaks with gold brooches blue shining spears and shirts of striped silk but they seemed to have some great trouble on them and to be very downhearted I know those men well said Fergus it is well for those who are on their side and it is a pity for any others that stand against them for they are able by themselves to fight the whole army of Ireland for they are Cucullan's men from Martevna that night, the Maragu came, like a lean, grey-haired hag, and she went shrieking between the armies one to the other, hopping and leaping over the points of their weapons to stir up the anger between them, calling out to them and taunting them that the ravens would be pecking at their necks on the morrow. Cucullan, still lying in his bed and sick with his wounds, he heard the commotion and he heard the hooves of cattle being driven away in the early morning, and he let out a great cry. His people came and tied him with ropes to his bed so that he would not get up and reopen all of his wounds. But the men of Ulster heard the cry of Cucullan. They were in such haste to get out to the battle that they grabbed up their weapons without stopping to get dressed. If the door of the tent was facing west, they went out through the door. And if the door of the tent was not facing west, they went out through the wall of the tent in their haste to get to the fight. Maeve saw the two sides clash together and saw that the two lines held. Neither army was getting the victory. And so she called for Fergus to come out. Fergus got his sword back from Oliel. And Fergus and Maeve and Oliel went down into the centre of that battle, where they drove back the line of the Ulster men. Now Crahor MacNessa, who was watching from the high seat on the hilltop that had been made for him, he looked out on that scene with his cold blue eyes and he saw the line of Ulster men being driven back. And he himself took up his shield, Ochon, and his great sword. And he himself went down to reinforce the line to put courage back into the hearts of the warriors of Ulster. He called out to them not to give way, and they swore to him that unless the sky should fall or the earth give way under them, they would not give up one inch of ground. Now Fergus heard the shield of Ogon being struck. When Grahor Magnas's magic shield was struck, it resonated all around the hills and valleys of Ulster to let all of the grave Rua know their king was under attack. And when Fergus heard this noise, it was music to his ears, and he went straight for Grahor to avenge his honor and avenge the sons of Ishnach. With his great sword, Leocon held high, he cut his way through the army facing him, until he faced Cormac Nasa. But Cormac Conlingus, 
Rohor's own son wrapped his arms around Fergus's knees and begged him not to kill his father. Fergus told Rohor to get back to his place behind the army and with anger in his arm, his sword hand held high, he turned his three great magic blows of the Leocon sword off the tops of three nearby hills, cutting them down. Cúchulain too heard the sound of the shield of Ochon being struck, and he strained against the ropes that tied him to the bed, and he leapt out of it, breaking them, throwing off the healing herbs that were on his body. And he rushed out and could not find his arms and armor, for they were all scattered and broken. And he saw his chariot there, and it was broken too. And he snatched up the broken shaft of the chariot and ran into the battle to save his king. He came to where Fergus stood and rushed ahead to face him and shouted out to Fergus, to give way before him, but Fergus said, I will not. You must, Fergus. You promised me, and I gave way before you at the ford. And so Fergus McRoy turned and gave way three paces. But when the army of the men of Ireland saw him turn, their nerve broke and they ran. Now the men of Ulster harried them, pursuing them, slaughtering them. It became a great rout, as the army of Ireland were driven back to the west. They followed after the fleeing men of Ireland, making a great slaughter, and Cúchulain himself wearing down the broken shaft of his chariot till it was just splinters. And when Cúchulain caught up with Maeve, she called out to him, a gift for me, Cúchulain, she said, and take my army under your protection now. Cúchulain agreed. He'd had enough of slaughter and of blood. And so Maeve and Oliel and their sons, the Manyas, they put their shields up around the men of Ireland. They stopped at Orluan and let the army trickle through. Cúchulain watched the army leave Ulster. The Crave Rua turned around and headed back for Owen Maka. The brown bull of Cooley was driven into the fields of Cruachan Eye, where the white-horned bull was waiting. Thank you for listening to All of the Thorn. That was our five episodes. If you just caught the last one there now, you might be very confused as to what's going on at all. So maybe go back and listen to the first four. If you've listened to the, well, the last five episodes, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for sharing. This is our Patreon Appreciation Month, so we're doing this in honour of the people who've given us the token and supported us to do this and asked us quite a lot we're five years old this year and well it's our first birthday as well for the podcast so it's kind of a double birthday so if you want to help support us do more of the podcasts well go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales that's it the name of the company again i start with my sister now there'll be a few tote bags going out for the i think it's the top 10 of the newest people that come in so and support us if we have a few more tote bags sure there's the candle tales thing it looks great it's as i said before environmentally friendly you'll find out if you go on there a little bit more about the sources that we use the book especially that we used for this book that my sister wrote a lot about and um more content like outtakes and stuff like that but for now, I just want to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for sharing. And thank you especially for those of you who've donated and supported us already on Patreon. That is Anna Anne Anne, Aoife April, Claire Claire, Connie Desi Dahi, Emma Emmett, Kiva Margarita, Pamela, Russell, Selena, Simone and Sweeney. Thank you very much. Did I miss anyone? 